Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, and I'm finally back with another chapter of Girl Interrupted. I apologize for the long lapses in between chapters. I'm going to try to get much better about that. Anyway, this chapter is called 1968. The world didn't stop because we weren't in it anymore. Far from it. Night after night, tiny bodies fell to the ground on our TV screen. Black people, young people, Vietnamese people, poor people. Some dead, some only bashed up for the moment. There were always more of them to replace the fallen and join them the next day. Then came the period when people we knew, not knew personally but knew of, started falling to the ground. Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy. Was that more alarming? Lisa said it was natural. They gotta kill them, she explained, otherwise they'll never settle down. But it didn't seem to be settling down. People were doing the kinds of things we had fantasies of doing, taking over universities and abolishing classes, making houses out of cardboard boxes and putting them in people's way, sticking their tongues out of policemen. We'd cheer them on, those little people on our TV screen, who shrank as their numbers increased until they were just a mass of dots taking over our universities and sticking their tiny tongues out. We thought eventually they'd get around to, quote, liberating us too. Right on, we'd yell at them. Fantasies don't include repercussions. We were safe in our expensive, well-appointed hospital, locked up with our rages and rebellions. Easy for us to say right on. The worst we got was an afternoon in seclusion. Usually all we got was a smile, a shake of the head, a note on our charts. Identification with protest movements. They got cracked skulls, black eyes, kicks to the kidneys, and then they got locked up with their rages and rebellions. So it went on, month after month of battles and riots and marches. These were easy times for the staff. We didn't, quote, act out. It was all acted out for us. We were not only calm, we were expectant. The world was about to flip. The meek were about to inherit the earth, or more precisely, wrest it from the strong. And we, the meekest and the weakest, would be the heirs to the vast estate of all that had been denied to us. But this didn't happen. Not for us, and not for any of those other claimants to the estate. It was when we saw Bobby Seale bound and gagged in a Chicago courtroom that we realized the world wasn't going to change. He was in chains like a slave. Cynthia was particularly upset. They do that to me, she cried. It was true that they did tie you down and put something in your mouth when you had shock to stop you from biting your tongue during the convulsion. Lisa was angry too, but for another reason. Don't you see the difference, she snarled at Cynthia. They have to gag him because they're afraid people will believe what he says. We looked at him, a tiny dark man in chains on our TV screen with one thing we would always lack, credibility. This chapter is called Bare Bones. For many of us, the hospital is as much a refuge as it was a prison. Though we were cut off from the world and all the trouble we enjoyed stirring up out there, we were also cut off from the demands and expectations that had driven us crazy. What could be expected of us now that we were stowed away in a loony bin? The hospital shielded us from all sorts of things. We'd tell the staff to refuse phone calls or visits from anyone we didn't want to talk to, including our parents. I'm too upset, we'd wail, and we wouldn't have to talk to whoever it was. As long as we were willing to be upset, we didn't have to get jobs or go to school. We could weasel out of anything except eating and taking our medication. In a strange way, we were free. We'd reached the end of the line. We had nothing more to lose. Our privacy, our liberty, our dignity, all this was gone, and we were stripped down to the bare bones of ourselves. Naked, we needed protection, and the hospital protected us. Of course, the hospital had stripped us naked in the first place, but that just underscored its obligation to shelter us. And the hospital fulfilled its obligation. Somebody in our families had to pay a good deal of money for that. $60, $1967 a day just for the room therapy drugs and oh just for the room excuse me therapy drugs and consultations were extra 90 days was the usual length of mental hospital insurance coverage but 90 days was barely enough to get started on a visit to McLean my work up alone took 90 days the price of several of those college educations I didn't want was being spent on my hospitalization if our family stopped paying, we stopped staying, and we were put naked into a world we didn't know how to live in anymore. Writing a check, dialing a telephone, opening a window, locking a door, these were just a few of the things we all forgot how to do. Our families, the prevailing wisdom was that they were the reason we were in there, yet they were utterly absent from our hospital lives. 
We wondered, were we as absent from their lives outside? Lunatics are similar to designated hitters. Often an entire family is crazy, but since an entire family can't go into the hospital, one person is designated as crazy and goes inside. Then, depending on how the rest of the family is feeling, that person is kept inside or snatched out to prove something about the family's mental health. Most families were proving the same proposition. We aren't crazy, she is the crazy one. Those families kept paying. But some families had to prove that nobody was crazy, and they were the ones who threatened to stop paying. Tori had that sort of a family. We all liked Tori because she had a noble bearing. The only thing wrong with her was her was amphetamines. She'd spent two years shooting speed in Mexico, where her family lived. Amphetamines had made her face pale and her voice tired and drawling, or rather it was the lack of amphetamines that made her this way. Tori was the only person Lisa respected, probably because they had the needle in common. Every few months, Tori's parents flew from Mexico to, to Boston to harangue her. She was crazy, she had driven them crazy, she was malingering, they couldn't afford it, and so forth. And after Tori left, they would give a report in her tired drawl. Then Mom said, you made me into an alcoholic. And then Dad said, I'm, never going, to see, I'm going to see you never get out of this place. And then they sort of switched, and Mom said, you're nothing but a junkie. And Dad said, I'm not going to pay for you to take it easy in here while we suffer. Why do you see them, Georgina asked. Oh, said Tori. It's how they show their love, said Lisa. Her parents never made contact with her. The nurses agreed with Lisa. They told Tori she was mature for agreeing to see her parents when she knew they were going to confuse her. Confuse was the nurse's word for abuse. Tori was not confused. I don't mind this place, she said. It's a break from Mexico. In Tori's mouth, Mexico sounded like a curse. Mexico, she'd say and shake her head. In Mexico, there was a big house with porches back and front. There were servants, there was sun every day, and there were amphetamines for sale in the drugstore. Lisa's thought it sounded pretty good. It's death, said Tori. Being in Mexico means being dead, and shooting speed to feel like you're not quite dead, that's all. Sometimes Valerie or another nurse tried explaining to Tori that she could be in Mexico without going to the drugstore and buying amphetamines. You haven't been there, Tori said. In August, Tori's parents called to announce that they were coming up to get her. Taking me home to die, she said. We won't let you go, said Georgina. That's right, I said. Right, Lisa? Lisa wasn't making any promises. What can we do about it? Nothing, said Tori. That afternoon, I asked Valerie, you wouldn't let Tori's parents take her back to Mexico, would you? We're here to protect you, she said. What does that mean? I asked Lisa that evening. It doesn't mean shit, said Lisa. For about a week, there was no word from Tori's parents. Then they called to say they'd meet her at the Boston airport. They didn't want to bother coming out to the hospital to pick her up. You could hop out on the way to the hospital, said Lisa, somewhere downtown, get right onto the subway. She was an old hand at escape planning. I don't have any money, said Tori. We pooled our money. Georgina had $22. Polly had 18. Lisa had 12. I had 15.95. You could live for weeks on this, Lisa told her. One, maybe, said Tori, but she looked less depressed. She took the money and put it in her bra and made quite a lump. Thanks, she said. You've got to have a plan, Lisa said. Are you going to stay here or leave town? I think you ought to leave town right away. And go where? Don't you have any friends in New York, Georgina asked. Tori shook her, set, shook her head. I know you people, and I know some junkies in Mexico. That's it. Lisa Cody, said Lisa. She's a junkie. She'd put you up. She's not reliable, said Georgina. She'd use all that money for junk anyhow, I said. I might too, Tori pointed out. That's different, said Lisa. We gave it to you. Don't, Polly said. You might as well go back to Mexico if you do that. Yeah, said Tori. Now she looked depressed again. What's up, said Lisa. I don't have the nerve, said Tori. I can't do it. Yes, you can, said Lisa. You just open the door at a red light and tear off. You just get the fuck away. You can do it. You can do it, said Tori. I can't. You've got to do it, said Georgina. I know you can do it, Polly said. She put her pink and white hand on Tori's thin shoulder. I wondered if Tori could do it. In the morning, two nurses were waiting to take Tori to the airport. That's not going to work, Lisa whispered to me. She'll never get away from two. 
She decided to create a diversion. The point was to occupy enough staff members that only one nurse would be available to take Tori to the airport. This fucking place, Lisa yelled. She went down the hall, slamming doors to the rooms. Eat shit! It worked. Valerie shut the top of the Dutch door to the nursing station and had a powwow with the rest of the staff while Lisa yelled and slammed. When they emerged, they fanned out in troubleshooting formation. Calm down, Lisa, said Valerie. Where's Tori? It's time to go. Let's go. Lisa paused on her circuit. Are you taking her? We all knew nobody could escape from Valerie. Valerie shook her head. No, now calm down, Lisa. Lisa slammed another door. It's not going to help, Valerie said. It's not going to stop anything. Valerie, you promised, I began. Where's Tori? Valerie interrupted me. Let's get this over with. I'm here, said Tori. She was holding a suitcase and her arm was trembling, so the suitcase was bumping against her leg. Okay, said Valerie. She reached into the nursing station and pulled out a full medication cup. Take this, she said. What the fuck is that? yelled Lisa from halfway down the hall. It'll just relax, Tori, Valerie said. Something to relax her. I'm relaxed, said Tori. Drink up, said Valerie. Don't take it, Lisa yelled. Don't do it, Tori. Tori tipped her head back and drank. Thank God, Valerie muttered. Okay, all right, this is it. She was shaking, too. Okay, goodbye, Tori, dear. Goodbye now. Tori was actually leaving. She was going to get on the airplane and go back to Mexico. Lisa quit banging and came up to the stand with the rest of us. We stood around the nursing station looking at Tori. Was that what I think it was? Lisa asked Valerie. She put her face up to Valerie's face. Was that Thori singing? Is that what that was? Valerie didn't answer. She didn't need to. Tori's eyes were already glistening. She took a step away from us and lost her balance slightly. Valerie caught her elbow. It's all right, she told Tori. I know, said Tori. She cleared her throat. Sure. The nurse who was taking her to the airport picked up the suitcase and led Tori down the hall to the double locked double doors. Then there wasn't anything to do. An aide went into Tori's room and started stripping the sheets off the bed. Valerie went back to the nurse's station. Lisa slammed the door. The rest of us stood where we were for a while. Then we watched TV until the nurse came back from the airport. We fell silent, listening for agitation in the nursing station, the sort of agitation an escape provokes. But nothing happens. The day got worse after that. It didn't matter where we were. Every place was the wrong place. The TV room was too hot. The living room was too weird. The floor in front of the nursing station was no good either. Georgina and I tried sitting in our room, and that was terrible as well. Every room was echoey and big and empty, and there was just nothing to do. Lunch came. Tuna milk. Who wanted it? We hated tuna milk. After lunch, Polly said, let's just plan to spend one hour in the living room and then one hour in front of the nursing station and so on. At least it will be a schedule. Lisa wasn't interested, but Georgina and I agreed to give it a try. We started in the living room. Each of us plopped into a yellow vinyl chair. Two o'clock on a Saturday in August on a medium security ward in Belmont. Old cigarette smoke, old magazines, green spotted rug, five yellow vinyl chairs, a broken backed orange sofa. You couldn't mistake that room for anything but a loony bin living room. I sat in my yellow vinyl chair trying not to think about Tori. Instead I looked at my hand. It occurred to me that my palm looked like a monkey's palm. The crinkle of the three lines running across it and the way my fingers curled looked simian to me. If I spread my fingers out my hand looked more human so I did that. But it was tiring holding my fingers apart. I let them relax and then the monkey idea came back. I turned my hand over quickly. The back of it wasn't much better. My veins bulged, maybe because it was such a hot day, and the skin around my knuckles was wrinkly and loose. If I moved my hand, I could see three long bones that stretched out from the wrist to the first joints of my fingers. Or perhaps those weren't bones, but tendons? I poked one. It was resilient, so probably it was a tendon. Underneath, though, were bones. At least I hoped so. I poked deeper to feel the bones. They were hard to find. Knuckle bones were easy, but I wanted to find the hand bones, the long ones going from my wrist to my fingers. I started getting worried. Where were my, where were my bones? I put my hands in my mouth and I bit it to see if I crunched down on something hard. Everything slid away from me. There were nerves, there were blood vessels, there were tendons. All these things were slippery and elusive. Damn, I said. Georgina and Polly weren't paying attention. I began scratching at the back of my hand. My plan was to get a hold of a flap of skin and peel it away, just to have a look. I wanted to see that my hand was a normal human hand with bones. 
My hand got red and white, sort of like Polly Sands, but I couldn't get my skin to open up and let me in. I put my hand in my mouth and chomped. Success. A, blood, a bubble of blood came out near my last knuckle where my incisor had pierced the skin. What the fuck are you doing? Georgina asked. I'm trying to get to the bottom of this, I said. Bottom of what? Georgina looked angry. My hand, I said, waving it around. A dribble of blood went down my wrist. Well, stop it, she said. It's my hand, I said. I was angry, too, and I was getting really nervous. Oh, God, I thought. There aren't any bones in there. There's nothing in there. Do I have any bones? I asked them. Do I have any bones? Do you think I have any bones? I couldn't stop asking. Everybody has bones, said Polly. But do I have any bones? You've got them, said Georgina. Then she ran out of the room. She came back in half a minute with Valerie. Look at her, Georgina said, pointing at me. Valerie looked at me and went away. I just wanted to see them, I said. I just have to be sure. They're in there, I promise you, said Georgina. I'm not safe, I said suddenly. Valerie's back with a full medication cup. Valerie, I'm not safe, I said. You take this, she gave me the cup. I could tell it was Thorazine from the color. I'd never had it before. I tipped my head back and drank. It was sticky and sour and it oozed into my stomach. The taste of it stayed in my throat. I swallowed a few times. Oh, Valerie, I said, you promised. Then the Thorazine hit me, like a wall of water, strong but soft. Wow, I said. I couldn't hear my own voice very well. I decided to stand up, but when I did, I found myself on the floor. Valerie and Georgina picked me up under the arms and steered me down the hall to our room. My legs and feet felt like mattresses. They were so huge and dense. Valerie and Georgina felt like mattresses too. Big, soft mattresses pressing on either side of me. It was comforting. It'll be okay, won't it? I asked. My voice was far away from me and I hadn't said what I meant. What I meant was, now I was safe. Now I was really crazy and nobody could take me out of there. All right, guys, and then there's a page here where there's a report from the hospital. It's very small prints, but I am going to try to read it to you so you don't miss out on any text of this novel, or memoir, I should say. All right, at the top it says McLean Hospital, number 22201, name case in Susanna, SB2, 1967, August 9th, progress note. The patient has been doing extremely well aside from depressive reactions on the weekend until yesterday when she was listening to some records and suddenly felt as though she were a teenager again and began to become very frightened at the thought that she was that she had never had a satisfactory childhood. She became fearful and agitated requiring a call from the doctor on call. She expressed her fears regarding her parents and lack of communi communication the fact that she has been unable to make satisfactory decisions throughout her life to the present time and also that her therapist is away. She's extremely agitated today and although not disorganized, she's going to need further support in helping her get through the time that her therapist is away. She's most extremely upset about her parents and their lack of understanding and she relates this to other people and that they can't understand or be trusted. I have spoken to her at length about decision making and responsibility, and she does feel better after venting some of these feelings. However, she will also have to be somewhat supported and protected at the present time, as she is going through a rather trying time without her therapist. In 82467 progress note, the patient suffered an episode of depersonalization on Saturday for about six hours, at which time she felt that she wasn't a real person, nothing but skin. She talked about wanting to cut herself to see whether she would bleed to prove to herself that she was a real person. She mentioned she would like to see an x-ray of herself to see if she has any bones or anything inside. The precipitating event for this episode of depersonalization is still not clear. All right, guys, we are going to stop here. I hope you are still enjoying this. We are a little more than halfway through the, the book now, so I really, really hope you're enjoying it. It's very interesting, though. As much as I love this book, and I truly, deeply do, I prefer the movie. I think because I'm more familiar with it. I've seen the movie more than I've read the, the book, and I'm just, you know, I'm used to picturing things the way, you know, the movie portrays them, and this obviously is quite different. For example, there is no Tory in the movie, so I am really enjoying it, but I also highly recommend you watch the movie if you haven't. It's very different in certain ways the the you know the general vibe is the same but anywho before i babble have a great rest of your day you guys and i will be back soon with more stuff bye